Blog Talk Radio. Hello, world. Welcome once again to Tuesday Talk with Key West Lou. I am your host, Louis Patron. Uh, great show. Many many interesting things have occurred. I'm going to share some revealing thoughts with you. Uh, if you're interested in calling in and discussing anything with me, questioning me, disagreeing with me, agreeing with me, the number is 646 646- Four seven eight five seven three one. I repeat, six four six four seven eight five seven three one. The number is on the screen in front of you. I want to say a special hello tonight to D, a good friend of mine. She is up in Boston, going through some heavy medical. I know she's listening in. We all wish you well, D. Hurry up and get better. Okay. I first want to say tonight. We all know Nelson Mandela died this past week. My comments are going to be brief. He was, he is a man for the ages. They will know him and speak of him a thousand years from now. That's how big he was. God rest his soul. I'm going to read to you now something that was written by a famous person. As I read the quote, I want you to think, who said this? Those who confuse rhetoric with reality demonize America's civil servants and who see the debt, the debt as the single greatest threat to our security. Today's other voices are heard in the land. Other voices Voices preaching doctrines totally unrelated to reality. At a time when the national debt is steadily being reduced in terms of burden on our economy, they see that debt as the single greatest threat to our security. Those words sound as if they belong in today, but they aren't of today. These words were written by John Kennedy. This was the speech he had prepared to give in Dallas. He never got to give it because he was assassinated before he had the opportunity. But this was the speech he had prepared. Uh, A national reporter by the name of Tim Dickinson came by it discovered it this past week in some papers, and I wanted to share it with you because the problems are always the same, it seems. One side yells the debt, it's screwing up the economy, the country will never survive, and the other says we've got to help people more. It's an ongoing battle. Ah, Italy. I have had the good fortune of spending some time in Italy the past two summers. Between Italy and Greece, I spent a couple of months in Europe the past two summers. Today, something unusual happened in Italy. We know how terrible the economy is in Italy. The worst of all the Euro nations, and it is the Euro's fault that these problems are occurring, is uh, Greece. And then you have Spain and Portugal, Cyprus and Turkey, and right up there, number two or number three with a lousy economy and ready to go under, uh, is Italy. Today there was a demonstration in Turin, Turin, Italy. It consisted of every walk of life, from truckers to students. These people in Italy have been suffering under years of austerity and recession in order to pay off the debt that Germany is demanding be paid back to the Euro nation. They get no breathing room. Merkel is hard-ass with them as she is with Greece. Well, a a movement started recently in Sicily. The farmers got together. They called the movement the Pitchfork Movement. And it's grown into a national revolt. There are demonstrations all over Italy. Today, it was Turin, okay? And the people were protesting. The auster- there were thousands of people protesting austerity, recession, the banks. The banks are taking people out of money's accounts to help pay off the debt owed to the euro without their permission. They're grabbing money like they grabbed it in Cyprus. Tax collectors. The taxes. 
The taxes have gone up four or five times on real property alone in two years. The Euro Union, uh, the socialist-backed minority government that, that is trying to pay off the, the debt owed to the Euro nations, actually Germany. On YouTube today, this all happened today, thousands of people in Turin protesting. The police were there, as they always are for these demonstrations. And you know how they dress today. They got these big helmets and the, the, this armor or whatever you want to call it. So if they get shot, the bullet doesn't go through. Uh, and they're just built like the giants today. They look like the Hulk every time you see a demonstration anywhere in the world. The, the way the police dress, they look like the Hulk. In any event, the police today at this major demonstration, this major protest in Turin, Italy, took off their helmets. Some removed all their police gear, and they marched with the protesters. They marched in union with the protesters. They were not going to oppose and fight their own country people, the protesters. They became one with them. Absolutely amazing. Uh, I have a sense. I've talked to several people already today. Uh, what happens next? They think it may go, because Italian people are crazy. Let me put it that way. They get very emotionally involved. This thing may, may take off. Uh, they suspect that if it happens in Italy, in Rome, in Rome itself, or in Milan, either of those two cities sometime in the next few days, uh, that it might be the, be the beginning of something big. There was a video today played on YouTube of the protest showing the police marching in unison with the protesters. What a show. going to be interesting what is going to happen, if anything. I got a feeling they're going to protest some more. And if the police keep backing them up, Leite's, Leite's government has to fall. And you're going to see Berlusconi himself maybe come back, his party will, because all this oppression of Berlusconi, these trials and everything else have been brought on by the political opposition to get him out of the political scene. They've succeeded right now. But this could bring him back. And I'll tell you something. If you talk to a person who is Italian, who lives in Italy. Everyone loves Berlusconi. It's absolutely amazing. Let's go to Iceland now. I'm going to share something with you I did not know. And I'm going to bet most of you, if not all of you, did not know. Let me start this way. For our news, we depend on television, newspapers, magazines, the media, the media. Okay, the media has to tell us what's going on, or we don't know. Now, today, it's not like yesterday. Today, the media is controlled by major international corporations, including banks. They get these big conglomerates, and they got all kinds of corporations. There's always banks involved, too, all right? Now, the question becomes, and I, I worry about this sometimes, and you have too, I believe, when you're watching Fox and they give you the far right opinion. And you know, it can't be just the way they're saying. And then you go to MSNBC and they give you the liberal approach and it can't be quite that way. It's got to be someplace in between. And I sometimes get the feeling I'm not getting the whole story. I want I want to explain to you that there's an instance where we haven't gotten the story at all, and it's very important. Let me start off, though, and stay with this bit about the media is controlled by major corporations. NBC has been was controlled for years by GE, then GE and Comcast. Today, Comcast owns all of NBC. ABC owned by the Walt Disney Company. CBS was owned for years by Westinghouse. Now it's National Amusements and Viacom. CNN is owned by Time Warner, Ted Turner Broadcasting. And Fox is owned by 21st Century and Rupert Murdoch, Fox Entertainment Group. Uh, Murdoch, you recall, got in trouble last year in England, he and his son, because they own a bank and they were screwing around. Okay. Now we go to Iceland, and I'm going to share with you a story 
that we have never heard, or Lewis has never heard it. And again, I've got to say, I I must believe that many of you, if not all, have not been aware of it. We haven't been made aware of it. Because the media didn't tell us. And what I'm going to tell you and share with you was in all of the newspapers and on TV and on the radio in Europe when these things occurred, and not one paper in this country carried it as a major news item of any sort. In 2008, Iceland overthrew their government. Did you know that? And here's how it began. It started the overthrow of their government. On the day that Obama was being sworn in as President of the United States in 2008, on that very same day, there was a major protest, which was the beginning of the revolution in Iceland. The revolution you never heard of. And these people were upset because the banks had screwed up the economy, just like they did in the United States. But it wasn't the mortgage problem that affected them. The banks in Iceland had inflated the value of securities. So now the banks were going under. And the government wanted to bail them out. Because the banks were too big to fail. Have you heard that before? Too big to fail. Well, the people didn't want to bail the banks out. They said, screw them. They caused the problem. Why should we bail them out with our taxpayer dollars? And the people went into the streets and protested. These protests were so violent that within two months... Listen to what I'm going to say, because you never heard it. And I don't know why. They don't tell us in this country. Within two months, the president and the entire legislature, their Congress, resigned in mass. Not one person remained in office. They forced the existing government out by going into the streets and protesting about the banks and saying, no way are we going to permit you to give them money to bail them out. Not only did they do that, (laughs) <laughs> they started a new government. They arrested. They arrested the president. They arrested politicians. And they arrested the bankers who were screwing around. And they sent the bankers to jail. Not only, uh, you know, in this country, they're too big to uh, fail. And then they were too big to prosecute. Iceland Iceland said, up yours. They prosecuted the bankers, and they put them in jail. Over over a period of time, the citizens, and that's what they called themselves, the citizens formed a group. It was several hundred, and their responsibility was to draw up a new constitution. They had it with the constitution they had had for several hundred years. They threw it out. It wasn't working effectively anymore. It wasn't working properly. As I sometimes think our constitution doesn't work effectively anymore based on these decisions that are coming down from the United States Supreme Court that I cannot understand. And maybe we need a new constitution. Well, they drew a new one, and they didn't get just the lawyers or the the congressmen to do it. They got people, the butcher, the baker, the undertaker, and they formed these committees to to draw up this part and that part. And finally, by 2012, they adopted this new constitution, okay? Uh, (laughs) And this all happened because... They weren't going to bail the banks out, and they were pissed off. The only way to say it, that the, that the government was going to bail them out. The, what happened in Iceland has been compared to the French Revolution of 1789. The people here, though, instead of going with brooms and knives uh, and clubs into the streets, in Iceland they went in with pots and pans. This is the pots and pans revolution. That's what it called. And they banged on them to make noise. Okay? Now, let's, let's, let's contrast what happened in Iceland with what goes on in the United States. We had the banking problem at the same time. Different cause, but a banking problem. Bringing us under need, to, need federal financing to bail them out, taxpayer dollars. The United States bailed them out. We bailed the banks out. 
they're doing nothing for us today. But we bailed them out. And no one has ever gone to jail. Not one banker has ever gone to jail for the wrongdoing that occurred. Whereas no bailout in Iceland, and they sent the bankers to jail. Uh, they've got a better government. They have a better government today in Iceland, they say, uh, because they're not no longer living. Uh, the politicians no longer live like big shots, nor do the bankers. They don't make the kind of money bankers used to make and are still making, for example, in this country. Now, my question to you is this. Why didn't we hear about this in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012? Why did it take until today for someone to break a story on this that should be hitting all the national media in the next 48 hours unless they don't want us to know yet? Because all of the media, I've just told you, who owns all these major uh, television and radio Companies are owned by international corporations. The conglomerates include banks, and they did not want, I believe, this is my interpretation, they didn't want us to know in the United States that someone had a similar problem and dealt with it in an opposite fashion and got rid of the banks, put the people in jail, didn't help them, and it worked out okay for them. This was reported totally and fully all the time in Europe, never brought over here, and you didn't hear it any place on any of the news shows or any of the talk shows. Now, they talk about freedom of the press. It works two ways. If they want to have all these rights to press, uh, they must tell us the truth, and that means you, can't sin, you can sin either by omission or commission. We can't have sins by commission. They must tell us everything. And in this instance, it appears they did not share very important information with us because I think they were afraid it would do them in if the people of this country followed in the steps of Iceland and did not help the banks. Moving on. Cheney, Vice President of the United States. Cheney was Vice President under George Bush for two terms. Mandela died this week. Cheney called Mandela a terrorist. A terrorist. <laughs> and he said specifically he's a terrorist and he was not a freedom fighter. This guy, I believe this guy influenced and screwed up Bush in his first four years. Bush became wise in his last second four years. And a lot of the wars with the the two wars we got into, Cheney, Cheney was a big influence because this guy, he's a warmonger. He's a fighter. He doesn't have to go and fight, though. He's too old and he's got a bad heart. But he calls Mandela a terrorist. And I want to tell you something. If Mandela's a terrorist, George Washington's a terrorist. Because after all, we were rebels. Remember, our people were rebels. They won the war, so they were freedom fighters. If they had lost the war, they would have been, Washington would have been hung or shot as a terrorist, just as Mandela. He, he was a terrorist, no question about it. He was fighting existing government. He succeeded, though, and because he succeeded, he was a freedom fighter. Had he and his people failed, he would have died in jail a terrorist. Now, going to stay on Mandela for a second. We're going to go to South Carolina. And this also comes in with that they're, they're still in this country is a dislike for black people. I don't have to tell you this. And we have a black president, Obama, doesn't help the situation any. And many people, in, especially in our southern states, think they're still fighting the Civil War more than 150 years later. Here's what happened. The president ordered, when Mandela died this week, that all flags over public offices in the United States be flown at half-mast in honor of Mandela. Sheriff Rick Clark, Pickens County, South Carolina, Pickens County, South Carolina, said, no way am I going to fly the flag at half-mast for Mandela. And he stood in defiance of President Obama's order. His position was very simply, 
The flag flies at half-mast only for United States citizens, no one else, and he refuses to make any further statement or answer any more questions. I think this is a typical Southern response to something which happened involving a black person. It never ends. This one, what I'm going to tell you now, is terrific. I, I, I subscribe to it. I support it. We should sing it in the streets. Uh, you're going to find it funny. Huffington Post, a reputable uh, publication, on December 3rd, announced the results of a national survey poll they took. What was the question? Now, you've got to remember, Congress... Uh, when they pass certain entitlement laws, they they want the people who are getting food stamps. They want the people who are their kids are getting fed breakfast food or lunches. Uh, they want them to take a drug test. They want these people to be in a cup. I think that is such an insult, such an insult to citizens of this country. I'm not saying that some of them may not be involved in spending some of that money on drugs, but there's a rotten apple or a few rotten apples in every barrel, and I'm sure in Congress, too. We've had them run around with prostitutes who are homosexuals. Nothing wrong with that, but they're pedophiles. They're playing with little boys who work in the Congress, the interns. Uh, you know, no one, is, no one is without sin, neither party. Anyhow, the survey was an extensive one, 5,000 people across the United States. Question, should Congress be drug tested? Should, should members of Congress be required to be in a cup? 78% said yes. God bless America. 78% said yes. 7% said no. Do you know some states, if you receive unemployment benefits, you're required to be in a cup? Make the people who vote for these things and who want these things, let them pee in a cup, too, if we're going to do it that way. Okay, now we're going to go to, I've talked about this so many times the last two years. We put too many people in jail. Our, our jails are bursting. But forget the fact we put too many in jail. They cost money. Uh, I have, I have said on this show several times in, in the columns I write and my TV show, it costs an average of $85,000 a year to maintain someone in prison. One person, 85000 a year. All right, we're going to talk only about federal prisons, okay? The population in federal prisons, it was announced this week, is up 27% in 10 years up 27% in 10 years. The reason, and this, by the way, this study was done by an investigative committee uh, assembled, prepared, commissioned by the United States Congress that just reported to Congress. The reason it's up 27% in the last 10 years is harsh drug sentencing. Harsh drug sentencing. Now, understand something. The sentence which a federal defendant gets is established by the Congress of the United States. Many Our federal judges in many instances, in many areas, do not have uh, the right to exercise their own judgment and send a person to jail for one year, 10 years, 20 years. The, the statute says if you commit this crime, you go to jail for 20 years. That's it. No, no flexibility, and the judge must send them. And most of our federal drug laws have mandatory sentences passed by the Congress of the United States. Right now, there are 219,000 inmates in the federal jail. The operating budget for this year is $6.5 billion. Now, let's look at some numbers here. In 1974... Drug offenders were sent to jail for 38 and a half months on an average. 1974, 38.5 months. In 2011, it had doubled by that time. 74 months now they're getting as an average sentence. Uh, and there's, an, there's another set of numbers to look at. In 1986, 
when the judges had flexibility in the sentencing and they weren't stuck with these mandatory sentences, 50% of drug offenders went to jail. 50%. In 2011, 90% went to jail. Can you imagine anyone that's, that's charged with a drug crime in the federal system is almost guaranteed a jail sentence? Now, we don't have money. This does, let's look at it from a money perspective. We don't have the money to support all these people, build all these jails. The 2012 budget was $6.9 billion. Of that $6.9 billion, only $436 million went to feed these people. 219,000 inmates, 436 million, whereas $2.5 billion went for drug treatment for prisoners who were drug offenders. $2.5 billion for drug treatment. Doesn't make more than the cost of food, so much more. Doesn't make sense to me. When we took milk from babies in the recent shutdown, where we took breakfast from school children, where we took lunches from school children, where we cut back, or they're trying to cut back, or they have cut back and are continuing to try cut back dramatically uh, food stamps, where they're threatening to cut Social Security and Medicare benefits, we're pissing this money away on drug offenders who don't necessarily have to be in jail. A lot of them could still be out because they're minor drug crimes. And we could spending that money to help the entitlement programs, not these people. It's the, the House of Representatives that takes the money away from us on the entitlement programs right now. It's the House of Representatives that had to approve, because they're the money team, the money for the jails and that $2.5 in drug treatment. Let me move on now. Something came out this week, shocking. Homeless children, New York City. There's a Michael Snyder. He writes a blog every day. This guy's a terrific blog writer on current events. I read him constantly. I've, I've quoted him before. He said this week there are 22,000 homeless children in New York City. 22,000. This is the last time the number was that great was during the Great Depression of 1929. We should be proud. He also said in something I read about a month ago that right now in the United States there are 1.2 million public school children who are homeless. 1.2 million public school children who are homeless. That means that this 1.2 million kids say goodbye to their mother and give her a kiss every morning when they're leaving for, for school, where they're sleeping under a bridge or in a woods. Uh, or out of an, an abandoned car that they live in, a deserted car, uh, or they're living in a tent someplace. Now, isn't this a disgrace, all these children? We are purported to be the richest country in the world. New York City should be ashamed with 22,000 homeless children. Wall Street, the financial center of the world's there. Bankers, CEOs are giving themselves 20 to 40 million dollar bonuses every year. We know this. And yet we have 22,000 homeless children. Uh, we're coming close to the conclusion of tonight. I want to share something else with you. I say this on almost every show I do now, radio, TV, wherever. School shootings. There is one in the United States every 11 days. Once every 11 days, there is a school shooting. Are we ever going to learn? When are we going to learn? When is this going to stop? When are we going to say enough is enough? Well, my friends, that's the show for this week. I thank you for joining me. I wrote a book, by the way, uh, The World Upside Down, Essays by Louis Patron. It's about the things I talk about on these shows, The World Upside Down, by Lu Essays by Louis Patron. You can find it on Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com. If you want something interesting and fast reading and revealing, get one of the books. You'll enjoy it, I assure you. And so, until next week, I, I shall see you. Have a good week.
Blog Talk Radio.